from the mysteries of the universe to the mysteries of the unknown, this is Mysterious Realms with Mr. Cyber. Here is your host, Mr. Cyber. Well, hello everyone, Mr. Cyber here with another show for you on Mysterious Realms. Today we're going to be talking to Robert Lindsay Milne, world-renowned psychic, who is recognized across the continent as one of the most insightful psychic counselors of his time. Uh, at a very young age, Robert started working as a psychic, doing readings at the Cozy Tea Room in Toronto, and at the same time battling serious literacy issues. He managed to overcome his disabilities and traveled the world, giving insight with his psychic sessions to tens of thousands of people yeah uh, this guy is fascinating because he um he helped narrow down a super predator slash super bug and uh the insight he gives is going to be absolutely amazing today uh, check out the description below for all the links to his website and to the book where he is quoted over 30 times on his unique gift. And this is by all means phenomenal. So without further ado, here is Robert Lindsay Milne. Hello, Robert. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great. And thank you very much for having me on your show today. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Um, so I wanted to go over, I was reading your background and it's so phenomenal. And it's absolutely amazing. And it really gets me how um, certain individuals, especially such as yourself, have these abilities. Um, I'd like to go back really quick. Please. When did uh -huh. you discover or when did you first notice that uh, you had these psychic abilities? So uh, I just want to ask you, that. so that are you asking me when did I know or when was I doing it? Because because there's a difference. Um, at around four or five, I used to say things to people, and I'd get into trouble. Like like I tell you one one story. One, one time I came home from school um, for for lunch. I, I might have been in kindergarten or grade one, um, and I, I come from the generation where our moms were at home, and you know we 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 she they made lunch. So. Um, I came in and I said, Grandma Harris died today. I'm five. Grandma Harris actually was my great grandmother. And she lived in London, England. I've only seen her once in my life. And, and, and by the way, I, I live in Toronto, Canada. And my mother got angry with me for saying bad things. And actually probably hit me for it too. So um, the next night at dinner, my mom and dad, my sister and I, were, were at the table having dinner. My mother says Grandma Harris died yesterday. And I thought my father was going to get angry with my mother for saying bad things. And they talked about it instead. And, and, and I couldn't figure out how come I got hit or yelled at uh, and they could talk about it. And, and for the next several years... I would say things and, and get into trouble. Uncle Harry, that wasn't Aunt Sally. Who was that? You know, that yeah. one got me into trouble. Um, I didn't understand why. But so so um, I, I started being kind of quiet as a kid, even though I, I, I'm vocal. So I was quite hesitant to, to, um, to, to express myself because I would say things and get into trouble and not know why. Yeah. And then came the night. Oh no, the night that the <laughs> night. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm uh, kind of old. I'm I'm I was born in 1949. So um, hockey in Canada for for me was you know the Toronto Maple Leafs. It was it was like a big deal. And in about 1956 to 1957, my father took me to a, um, a semifinal Stanley Cup game, and it was between Boston and Toronto. And and um, we had corner end seats so we could see, you know, the whole thing. It was, it was quite amazing. And at the end of the, the third period, the score was tied 1-1 and the season and the series was tied 1-1. 
when the teams came back on the ice for the first overtime period, now remember, I'm um, uh, nine yeah. at the time. Okay. So um, as the teams come on just to stretch a little bit, I became num- really attracted to number 17 with Toronto Maple Leafs. The guy's name was Gary Ema. And I knew he was going to score. Well, the game hadn't even started. Uh, the teams were just sort of stretching. So the referee blows his whistle. So the guys get on, you know, go to the bench. And, and by the way, Eamon wasn't even a, a, a first string player. He went to the bench. So the lights start to go down. The building gets silent. And I realize, like, because it was so real, I thought it happened already. And just as the referee was ready to drop the puck, I jumped up and started yelling and screaming and cheering in this totally silent building <laughs> with 18,000 people watching. And everybody looked at me and my dad. And and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, sit down. So, wow. Uh, uh, so, so I did. And but but and, and and I got really quiet. The referee dropped the puck. I wasn't paying a lot of attention because I was, you know, sort of putting things together. And I realized other people see things differently. The next thing, Eamon jumps over the boards, skates down the ice. A guy named Red Kelly passes the puck to him. He, you know, he flips the puck into the net. The, Kerry Lumley was a goalie in Boston at the time, uh, and the building erupts. And um, everybody's yelling, screaming, cheering. I'm looking at at, at flashlights, you know, the, the, the camera lights going off, and I'm realizing other people think differently. Yeah. And that was a, um, a moment of realization, and I knew at that point, I didn't know how it would be, but I knew somehow I would be doing this or something like that uh, for, for my life. And, and I knew that when I was nine. That, that's how it happened for me. Now, did that initial, when you first experienced that, did it scare you? Or was it just like a, wow, if that makes sense. It's kind of like, like a scary <laughs> feeling. Um, what what it what it did was was it validated why I was always getting into trouble? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, I I had figured that out. That that that's that's what it did. It just simply validated um, I was thinking differently. Now I didn't have the skills to say, oh, I think differently. Yeah, correct. I, I had awareness that I think differently. Okay. Well, okay. So all right, all right so. Um, now I got to tell you a little bit more about the story. This 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 is the cute part, maybe. So <laughs> so like I'm, you know, um, Saturday mornings. But this this game, by the way, was on a Thursday night. Okay. Saturday morning um, is allowance day when we were kids, and he, we got a quarter. And for twenty five cents, you you know, you go to the show, see three movies, a bunch of cartoons, you get a box of popcorn, uh, some some pop and candy. Like twenty five cents, right? Quarter went a long way back then. You think, eh? So, yeah. So um, I go to my dad to get my allowance. My sister got her quarter, and I say to my dad, Boston's going to win tonight. <laughs> and he says, Oh, no. Really? Like, I had just, I had just you, you know, uh, uh, committed treason. And and uh, I said, I bet you a quarter they do. Oh, and, gosh. And he said, oh, and, and, he, and he kept my quarter, right? So anyway, that night Boston won, and I doubled my allowance, and <laughs> and I hustled my dad. Like now we're talking about a nine, ten year old kid, right? I hustled my dad um, for for several years. I got so good at it. I had to let him win. I was worried he would catch on. Um, wow! Really, right? yeah. Wow! <laughs> He's yeah. probably thinking, what a hustler <laughs> at that age. He never, never considered it. Wow. Never considered it. And, you know, my dad, you know, he's 92. He's he's still alive. Um, he's just stopped working last year when the pandemic hit. So so my dad, though, but but he, 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 he says that he will go to his grave believing his only son is a fraud and a charlatan, even though I've been a professional psychic for 56 years. Well, you know what? You know when you have a gift, it's pretty obvious. 
you know, and it's, um, um, it, it, it amazes me. And one thing I wanted to ask you, um, and I don't think this is true. I think special people are given a gift such as yourself. Right. You know, it's an absolutely amazing gift. My question is, do you think anybody or anyone yes. can be psychic or everybody, do you... almost everybody is psychic. Mm, okay. So, so, okay. So, so being psychic, uh, is, is, is not being spiritual. Correct. Being psychic is not being intelligent. You can be really stupid and be a psychic. Yeah. So, yeah. so no, really, it's really, it's not a measurement of intelligence. Um, that, that's not what it's about. Being psychic is a natural instinct that just about all life forms have. Okay. Mammals have that. We're, we're mammals, right? So, so mammals have this very strong, powerful instinct. Have you ever been sitting somewhere and all of a sudden you look up and you see someone's been looking at you? Oh or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that is what it is. Now that's ah. the first level of it. So being psychic is a basic natural instinct that almost everyone has. So if you take a bell-shaped curve, put everybody on on a planet on this bell-shaped curve, at one end there's going to be one guy that has absolutely zero awareness. Yeah. Uh, okay? And then there's going to be another guy at the other end that has 100% awareness. And then the rest of us are all somewhere in between. Nice. However, we all have that instinct. So being psychic is 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 what caused us to survive um, on, on Earth? It's it's how we protect ourselves. It's 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 the way we live. Um, so everybody can do it. It's a question of recognizing what it is and how to use it. Okay. 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 Now, do I think I'm gifted? I really struggle with it, being gifted. Uh, with, am I gifted? Um, I think my gift has more to do with my ability to be dedicated and committed to something, uh, more so than being specifically a psychic, I, I, I think. Um, so when I realized, so, so I, I left home at a very, very young age, I, I was 14 and a half wow. when, when I left home and, and I lived on the streets in downtown Toronto and I survived using my intuition, my psychic ability uh, um, to, to, to survive. And, and um, it, it was my, so my, my abilities, my, my skills were honed uh, you know, in, in, in the jungle, as in the cement jungle. Um, and they were, you know, they were, they were developed for survival. So they're sharp, they're strong, they're keen. Yeah. I used it to get by almost all the time that the, there were periods where, so where, when I was being in trouble, you, you know, uh, 14 year old and there's a blizzard outside, you know, you're in trouble. So, um, I always had the op option of using my intuition, and I knew at that time I, what I was doing. So I always had the op option to use my instincts, my psychic ability, my intuition, or an illegal or an immoral act. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I made the choice of, of using my instincts, my, my, my intuitions, um, that there were some some times, very seldom, that that I had to do um, um, an illegal or an immoral act. Yeah, um, it, was, it was survival. Correct. Um, I, I I I got brought home by the police. I, I spent the winter time in this, you know, at fourteen or so, and then and then I was I came home, and then again in the summer at at age fifteen, I, I ran away, never lived um, at home again full time. Um, and that was when I started, um, realizing not only could I survive and use my instincts to be in the right place in the right time to get food. Now I never begged. I, I always worked for it. You know, I worked at a restaurant or washed dishes or something. Um, and so 
I realized that I also started to see things that could happen to people that I would be hanging out with. And I started noticing things like that. And then I said, gee, you know, maybe. And then, then I started just doing it for people, doing readings. But, but I'd also always been doing that. And there was this tea room in Toronto. And that, it was called the Cozy Tea Room. And that's where they did psychic readings. It, it, and and they, they sold tea sandwiches and cookies. And with the sandwiches and the tea sandwiches and cookies, you got a tea leaf reading and, and a card reading. Yeah. You see, back in those days, it was illegal to do psychic readings in Canada. Oh, was and, it really? Yeah. And the law just got repealed July 1st, 2018. Oh, my just, gosh. Yeah. I did not know that, Robert. Yeah. So up until what three years ago, um, my my uh, career, I I, I I was against the law. That's I, ridiculous. Could have got, got busted every any day of my work life. So um, at the tea room, what what they would do is is they would sell tea and then say um, readings are for uh, um, entertainment purposes. Gotcha. So what was that loophole? Yeah. Legal right. loophole. Yeah, you just can't get money for it. You could do it, you just can't get money for it. That's crazy. Well, yeah. Um, so uh, at, I heard that if you worked, the, now this was like in the wintertime, mm -hmm. and and there was a very cold winter uh, that January of 1965, and I heard that if you worked at the Cozy Tea Room and you did readings there, um, you would get a cup of tea, a sandwich, cookies, and you'd get paid at the end of the shift. And if you work there in the evening, you you would get a hot meal, a uh, cup of tea and, and cookies, and get paid. And and I I phoned the cozy tea room and um, spoke to the owner. Her name was Mrs. Cox, and I told her that I could do readings. And and I went down and applied that day, and I did a reading for her. Uh, by the way, I can't read tea leaves, man. I can't, <laughs> I can't read cards. You know? <laughs> you know, like on the street, you don't pull out the cards and say, how do I save my ass this time? You yeah, know? exactly. I, I was all about get, get in touch with your energy and take care of it that way. So what I would do is I would pick the tea the key cup up, look at the tea leaf, look at the cup, and look at the person and then talk to them. Okay. I developed that that day with Mrs. Cox. So I did a reading for her, and she hired me. And I worked in the afternoon, got, got, got a sandwich, a cup of tea, cookies, and I probably did about eight or nine readings. And then I worked the night shift. And I got a hot meal, man. I had, had a real hot meal, and I couldn't remember. Had a hot meal, again, cookies and tea. Got paid, and I had money for a place to sleep that night. And the next day I had a job. And uh, as I said, I was 15 and a half, and I started working at the Cozy Tea Room that day, and and I worked there till I was about 21, maybe 22 years old. Wow. And I would work five, six days a week, and it, every day doing readings. And so by the time I was about 21, I'd done my 10,000 hours. I had, I had done... Thousands Which makes you a master, because I think they said the minimum 10,000 hours makes you a master at something. Yeah, so I was uh, by by the time I was 21, um, I was doing things that other psychics w weren't even didn't even know um, w w was possible. Yeah, and and I um, and in a pretty short amount of time, I became um, one of the I was one I was the youngest person in Canada doing readings for a living full time. That's amazing. Nobody. Yeah, um, and. I learned a lot there. It was a pretty crazy place, place hey, to be. Hey, so Robert, I just want to mention one thing. Going back, so you mentioned, um, so we all have some type of psychic ability. Mm -hmm. um, it's, But it sounds like the average person shrugs it off. You know, but we, we were like, well, ah, that's, you know what I'm talking we're, about? We're taught to. Yeah. We don't naturally shrug it off. Hmm. We're, we're brainwashed to close our mind to that. Well, yeah, that sounds about right. Whether it, whether it be through a religious group or whether it just be through the way we're educated, um, you know, we're taught to think logically. Yeah. We're 
Well, you know, I, I, I'm from a whole different era, so I'm not, I'm not. I know what you're getting at, though. I totally I, get it. It makes sense. Yeah, we're, we're we're taught to ignore it. Yeah, we're we're taught to put it push it away. But just about all kids know can sense energies and stuff. You know. Yeah. We all have it. Yeah. Well, in in your case, you learned to actually hone it in because you uh, kept working with it and practicing uh, hone honing those abilities uh, which you already uh, had. But the Absolutely. more you did it, you, right. you could control it and actually understand it. That's right. So I don't around now. Now, I wasn't exactly a model employee. You know, um, I, I, I was a little bit rebellious. Um, Sounds like and, me when I was younger, <laughs> too. <laughs> and, and one, of the, one of the things that really made me crazy working at the now in those days, you that was all you could do there, there was nowhere else you could make a living yeah you know if you want to read tea leaves at you you know at your kitchen table uh, you know and get two bucks or whatever you know, you know th there was nothing available there was there was no one teaching anybody there was there was nothing available and what was was against the law <sighs> and most of us because I come from that era, I was you just started. Most of the people that were doing readings, I know the people at the cozy tea room, they were older. Well, they looked older to me. They almost always had some uh, addiction. Well, for sure, cigarettes, but alcohol or drugs. Or they almost always lived poorly. Um, they almost all were traumatized and 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 really were at at. Um, and, and and that's how how they were, and 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 that's how people that did this work, if it was their living, is 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 how we survived and lived like that. Um, you know, you go to see somebody that does a re get does readings. And a lot of times they live in a dump. It's not because they like to live in a dump, right? Yeah. It's ah. Yeah. Um. So so um. Traditionally, people that have done this work li live very poorly. Uh, and for quality and, and often have addictions and and stuff like that and and all of us have been wounded but the ones that are really good have been really wounded yeah so so um i i saw that and and at the tea room it cost two dollars and fifty cents to get a reading okay and and you know as i said they got a a uh, cup of tea uh, um, sandwich and some cookies, and the tea room got a dollar fifty, and the reader got a buck. That ate my gut sound. <laughs> you have no idea <laughs> when 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 I saw that these people were making more money from my ability than I was, right? And if it wasn't for me or these poor souls that were here, if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have a business. It's exactly right. And and I've always been, um, and so, and I believe that, and now when I say nobody benefits from my skill, what I mean is um, nobody Per makes money personally from my ability. If you, I'm doing a reading for you, when that happens, great. But you couldn't. I, I would not allow you to say, um, "Hey, Robert, um, I'd like to buy um, ten gift certificates. I'd like to give ten friends readings. And uh, I know you charge this amount, but how about giving me um, a ten percent discount on each one?" Yeah. Uh, no, you don't get a discount. You're not going to make money off of my skill. Exactly. Exactly. No, no, you can't have that. Oh. So, so I I saw that when I was like 16, 17, and and you know I got fired there a lot, um, but but I also quit a lot, and I always came back, or or Mrs. Cox always called me, and you know usually it was just getting closer to rent day, you know it was it was which one of us was going to call first, right? So so you know, <laughs> and then, so. Um, and and then and then you know I wasn't always um, uh, a rebellious because I also realized that this is what I was going to do, and I also realized that I was different than the people that were there, 
uh, one, because I was so young. And and I also believed I was better than them at doing the work than them. Yeah. And I was. I was. Um, but I didn't know how else to do it. Gotcha. So anyway, at around 21 or something, I, I at about 21, I then went through another stage where I said, do I, is this really going to be my life? And, and at around that age, I decided that, yes, it was going to be, or yes, it is. And I had heard that if, when a young man becomes a priest, he makes a vow to do, uh, to say a mass every day of his life. So I decided that if this was going to be my commitment, this was going to be my thing, then, then I made a vow that I was going to do at least one psychic reading every day of my life. Okay. And, or, or practice doing psychic readings every, uh, either do a reading or practice. Correct. Every day of my life. I, I did it, I, I made it a little over 30 years without missing a day. Wow, that is commitment, Robert. Wow. Yeah. And, and the reason I, I I took that day off, I wanted to find out what it felt like not doing it. Right? <laughs> that makes sense. I just wanted to know like what 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 what, what it felt like. Um, you felt empty though, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, now, I, I I very seldom miss a day, but but sometimes I do now. Um, so sometimes I do, but, but not very often. And, um, so I made that, that vow and lived up to it. Um, when I left the tea room, I was living at this flea bag hotel and, and, um, I've been missed the tea room. I've been out of the tea room for a couple of weeks and you know, I was behind in my rent and, and, and wasn't doing so well. And one of the night desk clerks, it was an older guy, probably not as old as me now, but, but anyway, um, he worked four nights a week and anyway, that he, 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 he died he was an older guy. He died. He was at home and he died. And when I found out about it, I went to the owner of the hotel and I, and I said, um, could I have Whitey's job in exchange for room and board? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't interested in making any money there. I was interested in having something that would be secure, that that I wouldn't have to worry about paying rent, and I would always have food. And he and he and he, and he took the deal, and, and I started working at at, at Larry's Hardaway at at night, and um, that. How again? Everybody knew I was a psychic, so I was I was doing readings there in in the daytime. Yeah. Um, my instincts helped because this was a very interesting place. Um, it was filled with single working people, prostitutes, pimps, drug addicts, um, street people, rounders. You, you know, um, it, this was not a classic place, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I, I dealt with all the, the, those I still doing readings. And um, I, I worked there for about four years. And it was during that time that I learned to read and write. Because uh, I, I, I had time at night where, where I could, because um, one of the reasons I had trouble is, is that I had trouble learning to read uh, letters. And so I, I, I taught myself to read and write during that time period. And, um, and then doing readings too. Now, um, it's a question that a lot of people bring up and, uh, I'd figure you're the best individual to answer something like this. Um, or maybe one of the best as opposed to, uh, oh yeah. I don't like the one that's, that's <laughs> too big a target. <laughs> so, so does being psychic mean that you can read people's minds? No can't read people's minds um can't do that um you can sense what people are feeling yeah um you can you can see by your awareness what they're going through you may not know what it is that's causing them to go through it though okay okay now, when you say reading people's minds, so reading people's minds in the moment, knowing exactly what, what, what they're thinking word for word. No, you can't do that. Gotcha. 
it's more um, it's more of a um, an overall conscious awareness. Um, now, we we think ESP extra sensory perception. So that sounds kind of spooky, you know. Oh, I've got ESP or, or infectious, one of the two. <laughs> but, but but ESP, well, extrasensory perception. We have five senses, you know, touch, taste, smell, see, hear. Put all those senses together, and it forms a sixth sense and an awareness. And, and when you pay attention to all of those senses, you will see what's going on in the moment. I used to teach a class on how to be psychic. Um, I haven't done it for a while. Um, and it's a one-day seminar, one-day workshop. And, oh, by the way, everything I do in, in my work, my, my readings uh, um, or life coaching, or, or um, well, when I was teaching the class, everything I do, I, I guarantee. Okay. And here's the guarantee. If I do a reading for you, from the moment I do that reading and until the ending of my life or yours, and hopefully yours first, um, if you ever believe the reading or feel the reading, the service that I've provided for you was not of value or you were disappointed with it, you tell me, I'll give you back your money. That's it. Wow. Now, if I did a reading for you 20 years ago, oh, I'm, yeah. not gonna, I'm not going to give you be giving you today's bread, right? It, <laughs> you're you're going to be getting what you paid 20 years ago. Right? Exactly right, Robert. Right. Okay. All right. So, well, but, but you so, know what? But something like that tells me, you know what? You're a legitimate individual because you like, you know, if, if you notice, like with other companies, let's say, mm -hmm. when you buy a product, they have a money back guarantee. And that's because their product is so good. Whenever I get a product like that, I never return it because it, it never goes wrong. And when you offer something like that, like who offers that when they know, hey, my product is great? Anybody, I don't know anybody in my business that does. Now, now what I didn't say was that I'm perfect. Oh, I correct. Okay. All, all I said is that what I do for you, you will feel it is of value and, and, and service to you. Definitely. And if I fail in that, I'll give you back your money. Well, and it's a service that provides some guidance as well, you know, that can benefit people. And, and I do give back money. The, the, you know, and now um, when someone comes to me for a reading, it's not guaranteed that they're going to get a reading. Yeah. If, if when I do a reading for somebody, if I think in order for me to let you have your reading, cause I record everything I do. And, and I've been doing that since the seventies as well. Um, it was on, as soon as cassettes were invented, whenever that happened. Um, so. Oh, kids, if uh, you're listening out there, we're talking about cassettes, go Google that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so, so um, I forgot what I was, I was uh, talking about. Um, oh, yes. I so um, it was about doing readings um, and 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 being uh, giving money back. So, so there are times when if I don't think I'm going to be doing the best that I can do for the person in front of me, I tell them and I say I'm sorry. Um, I, I can't give you the best the best reading. I'm, yeah. I'm really sorry. Um, so my goal, and, and I keep records, uh, my goal, uh, like on my calendars, um, there's different codes, and there's a DND um, beside a name, and that would stand for DND, did not do. And, and I write a note why I did not do that reading. And... and um, my goal is to keep it. My goal is to keep it at ten percent, but I've, it's difficult to keep it at ten percent. That's 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 a hugely high number, dude. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. That's huge. But that would be my dream. So it's you know fifteen fifteen percent, maybe a bit yeah. more. Um, where where I I'm just I'm sorry I can't do a reading for it. Or or there have been times where I got all the way through the reading, and said. 
I'm sorry, this is not my best, or this is not the, the I, I'm sorry, um, there, there's no charge. Wow. They don't get, they don't get the reading, by the way, they don't get the recording. It's mine, right? Well, correct. Yeah, that's absolutely right. right. And, and I go through a process. Well, now I do so much on, online, I don't get to do it. But but every time I do a reading and give person the recording, I, I always sign it. Okay. I always put my name on it. And, and I have to feel that my name, when I put my name on it, it's got to be my best or they, I won't do it. Oh, yeah, definitely, because you got to sign off on it. I mean, I don't yeah. think anybody would, so different like doing a painting, you know, you don't want to sign your name if it's all screwed up. Absolutely, absolutely. And so there, there are times when, when I haven't done reading for somebody. There, there, and um, because I can't tune in, there, there, are perhaps sometimes where I, I, I don't want to, well, and, yeah. and I have that free choice and free will as well. Well, yeah, and something like that absolutely makes sense because to me, it seems like you know the person that you're giving the reading to, they have to be open and let go a little bit as well. And is that right? Like you just have to clear your mind or you just stop somebody from tuning into you if you want okay you, you can do that but why would you want to well that's like, true like, like why would you go for a reading and, and deliberately try to make it difficult yeah that makes no sense like why, <laughs> why would yeah you? what would be the reason uh, you know um and and i wouldn't fiddle around with you know i i really wouldn't fiddle around very much and the other thing about my work is that my readings are a monologue, not a dialogue. So what 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 happens in, in, in my readings, you know, I and and I don't ask questions either, or almost never. Yeah. So you know, I, I I know the questions are, you know, what's your name, <laughs> you know, um, first and last, and and when I start the reading, you, you know, I have two questions: How old are you now? What day is you, what month is your next birthday? That that's it. And and then I start off, and I and I just start talking. And that goes on for about an hour. And I ask people, please don't interrupt me, even if you think I've made a mistake. And the reason for that is because when I'm tuning in and, and, and doing that, um, I'm constantly going over what I've already said, um, checking to see if, if it's balancing with what I'm saying now. And, and, I, re and, I, and I correct as I go along. And... If somebody, and often when I'm speaking, it's not necessarily what I'm thinking about. Mm. Okay. What I'm saying has already been processed and it's coming out. And what I'm about to say is right around here. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and at this time in my life, I when I do readings, it, it, you know, I, I, I'll be thinking about, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I've said, what I'm thinking about, and perhaps even what I'm doing later that night, and it, it's all happening all at the same time. And and if you could imagine um, TV screens on the wall, and when I tune in, um, it's like having four TV screens going and different channels playing. All at the same time, and I go back and forth and check it out, wow. and then and then and then there's the one that that uh, what I'm going to be doing later on that night, you know. Yeah. Now, if something really heavy happens in the session, you know, bam, I'm I'm right back to you know that one gets turned off, right? Correct. But uh, it, it's, that's all goes on in my in, in, in my in my mind, and what what I do, and um, I see the person's life from conce from conception to completion. Oh. And I go forward and backward in time um, several times in, in, in each reading. Now, I don't spend a lot of time at the end and I don't spend a lot of time at the beginning unless they're significant in how the person is relating and dealing right now. But I do see the beginning and often and I do see the, the, the ending. Um, I mostly concentrate on where you're at now, what brought you to this place, you know, over the cycles that you're in and where you're going to or how you're going. Um, what I say is not absolute. So I always leave what I say. I, I, I make open ended statements. 
Correct. So that because free choice and free will always is 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 the boss here. Um, now, so, he, now, Robert. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, brother. So I do something that I don't know of anyone in my work that does. When when I'm do, when I'm doing a reading and tuning in, when somebody is going through like a really bad time, and when they're at the point where they're having trouble, you know, making it. What I do is I look into the future, say at 60 or 70 or 80 years old, and through their eyes in the future, through their eyes, I look back and I describe to them how they feel about the success they have getting through this. But I tell it from the point of view that they're 80 years old. Wow. Do you have any idea how healing that is? Oh, it's very healing. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And I, yeah. I bet that brings a nice sense of, oh, there's not, I can't even find the word, peace, calm, tranquility. I just, just safe. safe, safe. I bet that's, yeah. that's wonderful. That's the, that's the one. Wow. So I'm constantly moving forward and backward in time, touching on things, um, you, you know, and, 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 and I, I work at, uh, not physically, of course. Um, and, 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 and I, I work, um, uh, on, on, on many levels like that. Wow. And and the words, yeah. So it's Rob, a buzz, man. It is a high. I wish I could be like that all the time. Wow. You of know. course, but but that's <laughs> one of those things that you know you don't know when it's going to happen, you know. But it comes along, mm. right? Well, what I mean is, it, well, I wish I could be in that space all the time because it's so wide. Oh. I'm not it's there. Gotcha. Okay. I cannot. I, like I, I really am a mere mortal. I just have this time period where where I can get into that connection. Gotcha. You know, I've done more than a. I have done more than a hundred thousand psychic connections. Wow, a hundred yeah, more than a hundred thousand. Yeah, they're the completed ones. Ooh, yeah. that's a big number. It is. Good grief. So, Rob, is um. Yeah. Is so is being psychic, in your opinion, the same as being spiritual? No, not at all. Um, totally different ball of wax. Now, now, let's look at the word spiritual because that's really important. Spiritual. So when someone says, "Oh, I'm spiritual," what do you what do you think? What, what do you hear them saying? When I hear someone saying they're spiritual, they're usually talking about God or, um, you know. <sighs> or if they describe themselves as a spiritual person or live a spiritual life, um, what, what, what does that, like? what do you think they're saying? Peaceful, love, uh, like Wood, Woodstock is the first thing I think of, too. <laughs> okay, well, that was a rush. Um, so... <laughs> 1969, right? Yeah. So, so I wasn't there, but but um, so when we call somebody spiritual, or when someone says, "Oh, I'm spiritual," they're saying, "Oh, I'm evolved. I'm good. I'm positive. Mm. I'm above all." This. Okay. Well, okay. well, hang on, hang on here. So you see, in everything, there is a positive and a negative. And what we are one way, we are equally the opposite. So as good as we are, we are e also equally bad. In, so, so in order for us to know joy, we need to know sorrow. In order for us to know success, we need to know failure. In order to know positive, we need to know negative. So being spiritual doesn't necessarily mean negative. Or sorry, positive. 
There was a dude in California, Anton LaVey. Oh, I've heard that name. Right, Anton LaVey wrote the book, The Satanic Bible. Anton LaVey was a devil worshiper, and he developed the Satanic Temple of California. Okay, well, hey, that guy's spiritual, but you might not want to be hanging out with him. You just hit the nail on the head. So just because you're being spiritual doesn't mean you're being good. Ah. And as positive as you are, you also are negative. And that's something really important to that, remember. That makes sense. Absolutely. So just like um, when it comes to judgment, judge not yet, you be judged yourself, right? Yep. Right, right. Because if I judge you, I think you're a jerk or something, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, wait a minute. That's not what judgment is. Judgment means... I have an opinion. Well, I've judged you already. I think you're a pretty good guy. So judgment simply means I've looked at the situation and made a judgment. The judge renders a verdict, not guilty. Guilty. Right? Well, which one <laughs> would you like? So, so, uh, so judgment is simply having an opinion. Gotcha. Not good not good or bad. Yeah, see, and I think people take that out of context, and I, I think you actually That's summed it up yeah. perfectly right there. It's just, uh, yeah. it's, it's an opinion. Mm-hmm. That's all there is. Yeah. So one of the first steps, here's another one. One of the first steps in learning to be psychic is become aware of what's obvious. Become aware of what's obvious. Um, pay attention to the person in front of you. Use all of your senses, touch, taste, smell. Well, don't grab them, but, oh, but yeah. use, use, all of your, use all of your senses with them and your five senses will come together and you'll get a sixth sense. And when you become aware of what's obvious, then more about them becomes obvious. And then when you become aware of what that obvious is, then more becomes obvious. And then more becomes obvious until eventually what you're seeing that is obvious for you in that moment is not obvious at all for others. Okay. Okay. So, so, right. Okay. So let me just give you another uh, more practical way of doing that. Yeah, sure. So I, used to, I made my career um, doing radio and TV shows, call-in shows. I've traveled around the world in about 35, 40 years um, doing that in, in, in mainstream media. So, so um, uh, the, way, the way that I would work, um, uh, I would ask people when they get on the air, give me a first name, where you're calling from. Think of a question, but don't ask it. Okay, and then this, you know, hi, my name's Mary, I'm calling from, and I just, boom, just start. Um, so... And most of the time, I, I, uh, what I was talking about was, was about what their question was. So um, another thing, I'm always doing air checks when I do call and shows. I did that when I was performing on mainstream radio. And when I do it um, on the Internet, I, I always listen. And, and, and also, at least, um, at least once a month, I take out a couple of readings that I've done that month and I watch them and, and I watch how I'm saying things. I'm watching how um, I'm relating to it, uh, the person. Uh, um, I'm making sure I'm not falling into patterns or because um, you can and, and, there, and, and you can fall into easy hits, you know, you know and there's, there's always them. And, and they're good to have, uh, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about how to figure something out. It's good to have those easy hits. But I have to make sure that, and, and I have to make sure that I'm not really just going for really anyway. So I'm constantly assessing what I do. Um, there would be times when I would be, and, and sometimes on the air, and, and I've been doing it recently. So I, you know, say to somebody, okay, so you're at home right now. 
Uh, okay, so then the building that you live in, this is one I actually did on um, um, FM, uh, Midnight FM. Yeah. Uh, when I, I did it with Tim last June. So, so you know, the caller comes in and, and I say, okay, so you live in this building. It's like, is it like an apartment building, like a small apartment building? The guy says, yeah. And so, all right, now, if you were standing at the front of your building, facing it, on your left-hand side, at the top of the building, halfway down, it appears as if there's been a lot of water damage, or there has been. The guy says, how did you know that? Wow, the roof caved in last week. Wow. Okay. Right. So I do that kind of stuff. So so anyway, um, um, now I'm trying to remember the point of that. Okay, so... Sometimes I don't do it quite as in your face. Sometimes it might be about the person personally. Yeah, and when I'm doing a phone-in show, I also have to remember that although I'm doing a reading for that one person, there's there's ten thousand other people listening. So so I'm putting on a show for them too, right? Correct. Correct. Right. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm entertaining the ten thousand. Um, the the ones getting information though. Anyway, so there have been times where I'm telling people, somebody something, and maybe just telling something about the type of person that they are, and I'll be saying to myself, Robert, man, this is so bloody obvious, man. You're going to get caught. You're going to get caught on this one for sure. Like, like, come on. Um, and then I listen more, you know, then I do some more. And when I listen to the air chat, and I'm listening to it from a different perspective. When I hear it, I realize that what I thought at that moment was really obvious, in fact, wasn't. When I was in a calm, relaxed state listening to it. Yeah. You know, when I was psyched up and focused and being psychic. So what I say is become aware of what's obvious. And then more becomes obvious. But what you have to do, when, if you're going to be doing readings or being psychic, what you have to do is become aware of what's obvious and say it. Not that it's obvious. Say what you're seeing. And when you get into that flow, as soon as you, the person is nodding their head, right, then then you give them more, you get more and more and more. Okay. That's basically, that's basically how you do it. And then do it about ten thousand times, and I'll have another <laughs> class with you. <laughs> so here's here's another question yeah. um because yeah. the yeah. the big one i'm going to eventually get to is i know you were featured uh in a book called the perfect predator mm. uh mm. regarding a super bug so i'll get that so i'll get to that here shortly um mm -hmm. but I, I know the audience is going to find that fascinating <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep that as a grand finale yeah. too um another question do you believe in god by chance I do. Um, we humans, though, and this is important, I think, we humans have as much awareness of what God is as a whale would have um, understanding the Gobi Desert. Okay. I we love that analogy. Don't. I love that. We just don't fucking know what yeah. happens when it's over. We want to know, but I don't know anybody that died. Hey, Robert Lindsay Milne dies, boom, and he comes back, Robert Lindsay Milne, exactly as I was. Not a chance. So when you die, this body, done. So wherever you're getting your belief from, it's not from somebody who came back and told you. Exactly. Exactly. You nailed that on the head too. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a fact. I mean, you put it in a great No, you you made that or how can I say you worded that perfectly because I liked how you also said, you know, how does a whale know about a desert? It's it's true. That's how yeah. you can't even yeah. put your mind. It's like you can't comprehend. Or you Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I, absolutely. So have you heard, you know, there's this theory, um, you know, some of the brilliant minds on the planet um, have been saying, oh, we're, we're in the matrix. 
No, I've you know what I've heard that a lot. We're in a computer program matrix. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Simulation. Well, yeah. Well, when you look at how complex that that simulation would be, um, probably a matrix. And there's another way you could say it too. Um, it's called creation. Yeah. So what the fuck do you think God is? Like, just wave a magic wand? He'd be doing some coding or something. <laughs> I know. He would programming, <laughs> coding, <laughs> C++, whatever it is. You know, yeah. <laughs> so in order to grasp who made that computer? Okay, God? Yeah. Okay. Wow. So what's the problem? And by the way, if you don't like it, um, turn it on. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Whoa. So. Yes. <laughs> so here's, here's one for you. And if I pronounce this wrong, please correct me. But, yeah. But uh, who is Dr. Stephanie Strathdee and Dr. Thomas Patterson? Oh, wow. Who are they? Uh, they're, they're they're pretty amazing people. Um, Stephanie Strathdee um, is a um, a professor of epidemiology at Southern California University. For, furthermore, she is the associate dean of epidemiology at, at the same university, um, and she's got about twenty seven hundred other titles and stuff like like she's like big time brains. Yeah, in epidemiology. Uh, Thomas Patterson um, is equally in that level. Um, he is has a PhD in psychiatry. No, he is a doctor of psychiatry. He has a PhD in psychology. He's an experimental um, psychologist in about a. He also happens to be um, a professor at you at that university and associate dean. Like, you know, like these guys. You know, these are in the top one per zero one percent of men. So, like big brains. Stephanie has been my client. She's from Toronto. Um, has been my client. She just completed her doctorate degree when she first came to see me. Doing, and she's been doing. I've been doing readings for her for that long, and. And then with her with her husband Tom, um, they go away. Oh, oh, by the way, so a year or so before now, now Tom is a really cool, interesting guy. Um, he's a Indiana Jones kind of guy, real real life kind of guy. Nice. Um, he's he's in his mid seventies now, but he's at six foot five, and you know he's a real macho guy. Um, he got kidnapped by the Sandinistas in South America when he was on a on a mission, um, an exploratory mission. Um, and, and, uh, he was captured and just about starved to death and, you know, he's, he's amazing life anyway. So Stephanie and, and, and Tom, I do a reading for Tom. Now he let himself go. He was got ballooned up over 300 pounds. I do a reading for Tom and I say, Tom, th there's something going on here in your stomach. And I'm not going to get into the whole details, but, but I said to him, um, it's, it, it, it could be really serious. And then I stopped it. And when I give bad information, and, and I don't like giving negative information, but I do, it, it, it's my moral duty to. What, what I almost always do is I tell them how successful they are, and then I tell them what they're gonna be successful at. Okay. So I tell, I tell them that they're gonna be okay, and then I tell them the shit they're gonna go through. That, that's... <laughs> hey, it's all gonna work out, but here's what's gonna happen. That's exactly, well, that's what I do. Okay, that, 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 that's what I do. So so with, with Tom, you know, I said to him, Tom, by this time period, you're going to lose more than 100 pounds. And then and then I said, now, Tom, there's something going on here in, in your stomach. And that's, you know, pretty serious. Um, and then you are going to get sick. And you're going to get so sick, um, you won't be able to get sicker than that and not die. Yeah. And then you'll lose a hundred pounds. And then I said to him, this seems like you can choose which one's your destiny. Get sick and lose a hundred pounds 
Let what I just said to you scare the hell out of you. Take care of your health, lose 100 pounds, and miss getting sick. And then I said, Tom, it's up to you. You can do it the easy way. You can do it the hard way. So a year or two later, Tom, and, and, and by the way, he didn't pay attention. Well, first week he did. Uh, he paid attention to me. After that, he didn't. So um, <laughs> I, I don't take it personally. I, I, actually, I don't care. Um, I give the information. It's free. It comes through me. Um, you do, you don't. Yeah. Um, I, if, it, and, and I really am like that. It's where yeah. that free will comes into play. Uh, Absolutely. With the person that you're giving the reading to. Absolutely. Now, I always want the absolute best for everybody that comes to me. And, and, and one of the things is I want them to be happy. But it's irrelevant if I want them to be happy. Yeah. It's none of my bloody business, actually. Because, you see, in life, we, in order to know something, we need to know both sides. So I have no right to expect that person to, to be happy because maybe in their life they need to learn about sorrow or, or being bummed out. It's not my choice. So, okay. So um, Tom and Stephanie go away on this beautiful vacation of a lifetime, you know, their 47th vacation of a lifetime, you know, uh, they're in Egypt. Tom gets sick, and then he goes into this pyramid and comes out, and he's in terrible, terrible shape. Ends up in the hospital in Egypt with this terrible infection. Then, out of in, all places, Egypt. Egypt, right? Mm. And then he gets medevac to Germany. Um, and now he's unconscious um, in a coma. And he gets medevac to Germany. They realize what's happened. Now he's in total lockdown. Um, like he's and because they find out he's got the superbug. Superbug happens to be 100% antibiotic resistant. That means if you get that superbug, you die. No cure. No cure. You die. So anyway, Tom's got the super bug plus a bunch of other things going on and 300 pounds, um, and he's in a coma. And everybody around him is wearing hazmat suits. He's, he's like locked down because they got to be careful with that. Bug. You can't, you know, oh, yeah, much. it's no joke. Right? No joke. Right. So Stephanie calls me, and it was when, when she just got to Germany. And, and in the book, and, and this also this when she called me, when I answered, you, you know, um, I said to her, I've been waiting for you. What took you so long? And then she writes about that in the book. Yeah, I do shit like that. But... <laughs> so, so anyway, um, sometimes it's fun. So, so a, a, anyway, she starts to tell me, and I say, yeah, I know. I've been expecting this. And, and right away, I tell her Tom's going to live. And then I thought my role with her was to be supporting her. The way it ended up is I created a mental link, a psychic link with Tom when he was in a coma. And I knew what was going on with Tom. And I knew it psychically 24 seven. I knew when he was strong. I knew when he was in trouble. I knew I I, I got to sense when his when his when his body um, uh, when when his um, vital signs changed. Uh, when and and I could always I always knew I could always sense that he had a conscious like he was aware, uh, even though he was in a in a coma. Correct. And I knew he was gonna live. Oh, I knew he was living. I knew he was safe because I had this visualization of a candle and a flame. And when the flame was strong, Tom was 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 strong. He was okay. When the flame flickered, there were some problems. And if that flame were not, he would have died. That's what that was his life force. I had a meeting with Stephanie every day. Um, and Stephanie, has the brain of uh, uh, the memory of like that guy Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory? Yep, you know? love that show. <laughs> right. Well, she's got a, she's not quite as geeky, but, but she certainly has um, that that memory of like some like Sheldon Cooper does. Yeah. And every day she would tell me or go over what I had talked about the day before, the day before that, and every day she was critiquing me and giving me the feedback of, of what I was doing. 
Um, I told Stephanie that she could find a cure. And I said, you know, you, you've got all the skills. You've been through all this before. The details are different, but the concept of finding the cure is the same. And you have all the contacts, you have all the experiences, and you can do this. And instead of being, and, and, and she was motivated. And she set out to find the cure for this superbug, this one that nobody survives. Tom, and, and, and this was um, a collaboration of some of the greatest minds on the planet. Um, scientists all over the world came together to solve this problem, although um, Stephanie was like the conductor. So she was doing all this research and she was coming up with what, 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 what can be done as Tom was dying. And um, he, he went into septic shock seven times. Seven times? He eventually, seven times, man. Um, wow. He eventually was medevaced back to um, California. They had to use two medevac teams because they were so concerned about spreading that, that super buck. So, so anyway, they got him back to California. So Stephanie's been doing the research and she comes to me and she says, um, I've narrowed it down to three. And she says, uh, I'm going to tell you them. And I said, sure. And she starts off with saying, the first one is called phages. And I said, that's the one. And she said, well, let me tell you about it. And I said, that's the one, Stephanie. And she said, okay, well, let me tell you about the other two. And I said, that's the one. And then, and then she said, I want to tell you about the other two. And I said, okay. And she told me about the other two. And I said, the first one. And then she said, why? And I said, because, and I didn't know what phages were. Yeah. I said, because it's like a little Pac-Man. And if you think a bunch of little Pac-Man will go after the superbug, attack it, eat it, and kill it. And she said, that's exactly what it does. And that was what, not just that, because she had lots of scientific support behind her, she made that choice to go with phages. Mm. Do you know what phages are? Do you know where they come from? Well, they're harvested from sewers and... Sewers? <laughs> yep. And oh, it's excrement. Oh. There were studies done in the 1920s and 1930s in Russia, where they were uh, um, doing experiments on people that had um, liver, bowel, uh, lower organ diseases. And they were experimenting by injecting um, fresh stool into the, I'm sure, you know, anally, uh, rectally, oh, yeah. um, the stool. And they were getting some success. Um, because the concept is, is that the good bacteria eats the bad bacteria. That was the concept. Correct. And it was, it was working. And then somebody invented penicillin, and you had your choice. You could have a pill or a turd. And the pill <laughs> went out. So, so <laughs> they, they, stopped, they, stopped, they stopped all research. And then research started happening again with the advent of the superbugs. And, but no human had ever been treated with them. Mm. And um, my job through that whole time, that, that was one time helping with the choice. Yeah. There was another time in Germany when, when, when Tom was in a coma and that flame was flickering, man, it was going out. Um, he was cold. He did not know where he was. He could not figure out what was happening. He was weak, sick, in pain, and he was letting go. Mm. He, 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 he was, he was going to die. It was happening. And I, 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 I said to Stephanie, uh, Tom needs to see his daughters. Yesterday would have been a good day. Today's a good day. Tomorrow's okay, but if you wait longer, don't bother. 
And that night, the girls flew from California to to uh, Germany, and they showed up. And um, I knew what happened because I saw the flame flicker and get strong. And the girls arrived. Now, after Tom had been healed, they, they wrote the book, The Perfect Predator. And on one side, Stephanie's writing about it on the conscious, and Tom on the other side was writing it about what it was like being in the coma and his recovery. And he talks about that experience of letting go, um, uh, breaking down. He couldn't connect, um, missing his children uh, alone, dying. And then he said, then they arrived and it brought him back. Okay. Okay. Had I not been doing my job that day, he would have died. That's unbelievable. Not, wow. Now, I'm not the star of the show. I had a small role in it, you know, a part of it. You were part of the circle to complete that circle. Absolutely. And, and what, what, so here's scientists saying this really happens. And our people, my people get recognition for this because in the old days, like as of the purple, perfect predator, um, they would say, oh yeah, well, psychic connects, but how do we know they're in a coma and then they die? So how do we know? Well, here's a scientist that was in a coma and, and it's, it's documented from both sides. Um, that, that certainly was one of my greatest experiences. Now, once again, I have to tell you, um, there was a worldwide collaboration of some of the greatest scientists on the, on, on the planet yeah. to get the phages to go from testing to being approved, to being injected. Correct. Um, which was the fastest time ever before. Faster than the vaccines that are coming out now. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you something amazing with, with that story. And a lot of people don't realize this. Um, and this is actually a fact. The U.S. military, and I'm sure other countries' militaries. The Navy and Army, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army donated phages yeah. in the book, too. Okay? Yeah, and if anybody's curious, um, if they look in the description below, you'll see all the links, including the link to the book, The Perfect predator and i must insist that is a great read so you might want to pick that up um but that's just absolutely it's more, it's more scientific than psychic yeah the editors edited out a big amount of my role um but i mentioned in the book about 25 or 26 times that's phenomenal well you're mentioned you know what Someone that doesn't have a big role is not going to be mentioned that many times. The fact that you're mentioned that many times tells me you played a significant role, Rob. <laughs> and, and what I really want um, is that it impact on the people that are coming up behind me. Um, that's, that's something that, that, that I, I hope that some of them, and there are medical there are people that are medical intuitives and, and, and I hope that getting that recognition will help them uh, be able to do their work and, and will help a lot of people. It, that would be really something very special for me. Most definitely. And, and now with the super bug, do you have any other success stories that uh, stand out that you um, would like to bring up? Okay, because well, I'm, I'm sure I, there's been a ton of them. I'm sure there's been a lot, but significant there, ones. There, there, well, there, there, there are several. Um, when I was learning how to do telephone readings, because they had never been done before, um, I, I had to... I invented it in Canada. I just thought it up. I didn't know. I didn't know other people were doing it. And 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 when I started doing telephone readings, uh, uh, nobody had ever heard of it. And then I started doing telephone readings on the radio. Um, there was uh, um, so so I started. Doing, I'm just trying to think of. So a lot of my career has been appearing on show, radio shows and TV shows, being the performing psychic. Yeah. And I was the first one in Canada and one of the few in North America in the beginning. There, um, anyway, um, I, would, I would go to different sta radio stations and I would audition to be on the, on the talk show. And, and um, 
I was flying to Ottawa. I was going to Ottawa. It was, it would have been in the 1970s, about 77. Yeah, maybe six, 76, 77. I flew to Ottawa to audition on, on this. It was the highest rated radio station in, in that, excuse me, in that area. And, and by the way, Ottawa is Canada's capital. And, and um, I went on the show and I, I, I got the, I got the, you know, I got the gig. I, 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 in fact, I was on that show every month for 12 years. Nice. Um, nice. But, but I, yeah, I, I got, yeah, it was a great gig. Um, so I, I, I won that one. And when I got back to Toronto, I got a phone call from the program director from that radio station. And, and he said, um, now, now remember, you know, telephones were still on the wall in those days. That was in the days when you got on an airplane like you were getting on a bus, right? <laughs> it was no, I remember right? that when I was a kid. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, I, um, and anyway, I go back to Toronto. And a couple of days later, the program director calls me and he said, we, get, we got a call from a guy I can't tell you his name and you'll understand why I wanted to. Oh yeah. Um and and he works for Task News Agency. And um he wants to do an interview on you. And he and the news director kind of laughed and said, "Yeah, and he's with the KGB too." And I said, "I don't want to know. I don't want any and I was only like 27, 26." I said, I don't want to know. I don't want to be involved. Um, don't give him my name. Don't give him my number. Yeah, especially with a KGB. Wow. Oh, you know, <laughs> just well, well, just 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 working for Task was enough for me. So, a um, few days later, I get calls from my friends. Robert, um, some guy named Sergeant from the RCMP was asking about you. But this wasn't with one person, like four or five different people calling me. And then I got a call from Sergeant from the RCMP. And in those days, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, well, it's still our national um, uh, police force, but at the time, it also was the security service. Yeah. Okay. And Sergeant from the RCMP, um, introduced himself and he said, you know, I'm Sergeant so-and-so. Um, I would like to meet with you and discuss a non-criminal matter. And, and I said, does this have anything to do with? And he said, yes. And I said, I'm not interested in it. I don't want to know. And he said, okay, we, we would really like to talk with you though. And you might be doing, you might be serving your country well if you do. And I said, okay, you know, and I was kind of scared, kind of interested, and, but not, but was. And he said, I have to wait from my, my partner uh, to come from Ottawa, because he's the specialist on the Russian desk. So all the, uh, all the embassies are in Ottawa, right? The other countries, yep. right. And, and this guy lived at the embassy. He also had... He also had diplomatic passport too, the journalist, right? So um, <laughs> anyway, these two guys, they come to my office and um, they start telling me about this guy. And they say that he had spent most of his life, most of his career in Washington, supposedly as a journalist for TASS, but he's always had um, uh, a diplomatic passport. Yeah. And all of a sudden he gets transferred from Washington to Ottawa. Uh, that's a demotion. Like, that is a big demotion. This guy, our guys thought that this guy was in trouble because that was just at the Brezhnev era coming to an end, and they had heard that this guy's people, protectors, in Moscow were losing power, and this guy was afraid that he was going to get called back to, to, to Russia and end up in, in um, some prison somewhere. You up know? Some political some, prison. Absolutely. Yeah. They thought that was going on. And they thought that he was reaching out that way was a signal. 
and they wanted me to meet this guy and wow. talk to him. And they said, we'll watch you and protect you. I said, oh, okay. And then I thought, hey, this is great, right? This is great. <laughs> so so um, I said, how do you want to do it? And he said, you call back the radio station, set up a time to do a show. Um, tell them that to get in touch with this guy um, and, and say that Robert's going to be in town and um, we'll, we'll take care of the hotel and everything. So on that day, I was doing a show, this guy, the first guy that met me, um, he met me at the airport and we, we, we flew on a private plane to Ottawa and and um, they picked me up at the airport and we went straight to that hotel. And the hotel that we were in was a downtown one. And the room that I had was was in, was a single room. And then there were two adjoining rooms, but they were closed, except that the room I was in was bugged. And um, there were guys in both room, both sides of the room, one on each side. And um, while they were waiting um, for him to come for his appointment, because it was arranged to the radio station even, right? Not even me. So, so um, they 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 wanted that to be done that way as well. You know, they wanted the radio station to do it. Just to, anyway, um, they gave me a they they gave me a briefing on this guy's life. And they were going, you know, you're telling me about this guy's life, and I'm saying, um, you don't need to be doing that. Um, I, I I'm okay on my own on this one. Yeah. And. And then, and then they said, now, near the end of your reading, this is what we want you to say. Sometimes we can get into trouble. And sometimes we have friends in unlikely places. And you have them if you would like. That's what I was supposed to say to him. Wow. Okay, so... Wow. I started doing the reading for the guy, and it turns out the shit that they had in his di in his in his dossier was incorrect. So now I've got this briefing, and the only time in my career I've ever been coached, and the information was wrong. Oh my goodness! So like I just you know got rid of that from my brain, oh, and good. then I just did a regular reading for the guy. Oh my gosh! Right, so I do the reading. Right near the end, I, I, I say my spiel. The guy stood up, turned around, and just walked right out the door. Oh, he did. Just got up and walked out the door. I, I, he, he was the, tripping, he, wasn't he? He just, he just got up and split. And, and I didn't even say goodbye. Just got up, turned around, and left. Just like that. Boom. And then, you know, our guys came in the room and they said, I, I said, I, I, I think I blew it. And, and he said, no, you nailed it. <laughs> he said, what, what happened is, is that if you ever presented something like that to those guys, that's what they do. That had been what they had classically done. Just get up and walk away. Because what they wanted, what they were thinking is that he wanted to defect. Yeah. That's what that was all about. Oh, that's crazy. All right. Now, so then I went on and did my show. And um, then the other guy contacted me again in Toronto when I came back. And he said, can you find things? And I said, well, it depends. And, and he said, well, you know, in Niagara Falls, which is where he was based, Niagara Falls. And in that time, that era, the border of Niagara Falls, Canada, and the United States, there was more intelligence passed at that border than anywhere in the world. Really? Yeah. And our guys, that was one of the biggest security out, de um, out uh, press precincts um, in Canada. That's fascinating. And, and, and now, you know, Canadians and Americans, we're, we're, we're a little bit different. And in those days... Our uh, spies were were um, covert or um, covert is inward, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they were covert in that what they were looking at is where the um, where the information was being passed, who was passing it, and who was coming to get it. They just watched. They didn't do anything. So. Um, 
he invited me down to Niagara Falls one day, and I went there, and, and he talked about what he was thinking about, and and um, he got some maps out. He said, what we're looking for is dead letter boxes. So that was where information, he called, that was what where information, what was called where dead information was dropped off. And we looked, started looking at, at maps of, of the park, and, and, and I was finding spots on the park where, where there was a lot of energy, and then we would go out and look. And, and, and over that year and a half, I, I, I went down there every month, and over that year and a half, I, I, I found a significant amount of, of dead letter boxes. Um, and then, and then um, after I do that, like they pay my way down, and then, and then those guys had um, expense accounts, and then we'd go out in town and party all night. And, <laughs> They load me on a bus, you know, and I'd go home and you know hung over and and then come down the next month. And and one time we were looking at the maps, and he just said to me, um, you know, you know our friend from Ottawa, and, and I said, yeah. He said it it, it it turned out good. Wow. I, I, I that, that's all I ever knew. Nice. That's all I ever. Knew. That. Okay, so um, that happens, and then and then the year and a half looking for um, dead letter boxes found a lot. Did you really? Pardon? Yeah. So you did there find a lot of those. You did find oh, yeah, several. Wow. Several. Now here's you know how some sometimes things go together like like there's a synchronicity. Yep. At that time. I also was dating and living with um, an Air Canada flight attendant. Uh, I actually met her on the flight going to Ottawa. <laughs> the first <laughs> so hey, it's so, all good, brother. Hey, it's all good, right? So, so um, she was doing flights. They called Havana turnarounds. Now, now we didn't have the same kind of fight with Cuba that you guys did, so so we we were kind of neutral, um, and and although I never agreed that we should be tourists there, and I never went to Cuba. Well, you know what? I don't mean to interrupt you. We actually went to Cuba a couple of years ago on a cruise. We left from Florida down to Havana, and that was a Whoa. few months before they shut it down. And um, wow. you know what? Even though. Cuba is like what? It's like seventy-five kilometers or something off the coast of Key West, Florida. It's a it's a whole different world. It's a whole different world. Wow. So, so um, Eleanor was doing what we they called Havana turnarounds. Mm -hmm. So they would take a load of um, tourists down to down to Havana, which was with Air Canada, um, and then and then bring a load back. So, so they wouldn't stay over. They just, they just, just bring some down and bring some back. And one time when I met her at the airport, she did that overnight, and and she and I and I saw this big envelope in in her purse, and I said, oh, what you got there? And she said, oh, and I think the girl's name was Roseanne or something. She says, oh, Roseanne in Havana asked me to bring it up. And I said, Roseanne. Roseanne. <laughs> Like, like who? Would, oh, she's the, oh, she's great. She works at the, um, at, at the departure desk. And I said, she's like, like with Air Canada. Oh yeah, I, was, I said, it's like, like she's a Canadian working for Air Canada. No, no, she, she, you know, she's from Cuba. And I said, well, um, she asked you to do what? Well, to drop this off and then put it in the mailbox. And I said, oh. Does this happen very often? And she said, oh, yeah, the girls always are bringing stuff back for her. She's mailing them to her relatives around the world. And I'm thinking, that's not right. There's something smelly here. So I call my friend in, in, in um, Niagara Falls, and I say, by the way, Eleanor's fallen into something here. What, what do you think? And there was, like, silence. And then I get a call from a guy, you know, he says, hang on, Robert. And then like an hour later, I get a call from a guy in Toronto who's in charge of the Cuba desk. And he said, we've been watching them. We were trying to figure out how that's been happening. So that night or a couple of nights later when Eleanor had done her over overnight, you know, me and a couple of RCMP guys, we were there um, and she and they were watching her come in with with, with the stuff and and um, the, the people that were coming to get the envelope. 
they didn't do anything with it. They just watched. What? They didn't do anything. They didn't do a, a darn thing. Well, publicly. Yeah. That you could have been t- could have told you guys. I don't I don't know what ever happened. Although later Eleanor told me that she wasn't there anymore. That girl wasn't there anymore, and they weren't being asked to do it anymore. Well, that's crazy. It was going to East Germany. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. It's when yeah. the whole Iron you know, Curtain and everything was going on. Yeah. So I didn't, yeah, well, well, yeah. Um, now, I didn't psychically do that one with, with the uh, Cuba thing, right? I, I, I didn't do that one. Yeah. But it was because of what I did do um, with the, the Russian agent that I was attuned and I had the contacts and I saw it. That is fascinating, Robert. That is. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to go back myself and re-listen to that because that, that's deep. That's very deep. You know, it happened so long ago, um, and it's a big one, um, but there's been so many. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure there have been so many. You know, it's it's hard to keep track of them because there's so many. It's like even me. So I'm 38 years old. And yeah. I've done a, I've been to pretty much every continent except Antarctica and all that crap. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't go to the cold ones. We don't need to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, we don't be going to that. But but there's so yeah. many stories. Even though I'm 38, I like I don't even know which ones to pick and choose. You know, I right. can't imagine your position. You have so many great success stories. It's like which ones stand out. I mean, I'm sure there are those select ones, but it's there's a lot. We we have haven't even um you know scratched the surface oh i'm sure we haven't i'm sure we haven't you know, the, the scratch the surface and um some of the things that, that have happened to me and and happened in my career and and um it's it, it's really kind of astonishing and um you know about eight or nine years ago like like I, i'd been traveling um 35 40 years appearing on shows and I always traveled with a full-time secretary, doing an interview and then doing readings on, on, on an interview like this in mainstream radio or TV. Yeah, uh, would, would take me to a city for a whole week. Myself, my secretary, um, we, we would be there for a whole week doing readings as well, and then go on to the next town. So now um, I don't travel at all, but I'm still doing doing shows again. About eight years ago, maybe nine, I got to the point where it wasn't fun. And I was um, on a Toronto station, which I am in Toronto. And and I was on the highest rated show and station in Canada and the highest rated show on this at the station. And I went on at 9.05 and I was on till 9.55. And at about quarter after nine, I looked at the clock and said, shit, 40 more minutes of this. Shit. And when the show was over, I just said, this is it. No, no more shows. And and it wasn't from a heartbreak. Oh, it's terrible. It's over. It was, wow, this has been a great ride. It's just not fun anymore. And so I decided that I would just slow down. I'd be an old-fashioned psychic and yeah. do readings from home, stuff like that. And you know, I slowed down. I, you know, I do five, six hundred readings a year still. And and uh, then Michelle, then that book came out. Yeah. And then and then I was on a show with uh, Tom and Stephanie, and Michelle said, you know, Robert, you might want to consider doing some shows. And I thought, hmm, maybe. Well, that was last August. And since August and August 11th and until now, I've been on 26 shows. It's great. It's well, you know what? I've, I've, I've listened to a couple of your shows and I absolutely oh, I loved them. Absolutely I loved them. Because I, 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 I was going through YouTube, for example. And I was like, man, this guy is great to talk to or great to listen to because yeah. you're so fascinating. And each show is a little bit different, you know, and it's um, yeah. and I actually think that's a good route, you know, because there's a lot of people, Robert, who want to hear 
uh, your message and, you know, other individuals messages and, you know, such as myself, I got about 50,000 listeners, um, and, gr- and, and we're growing. Um, and you know, people want to hear this stuff. I think some people are just in your position, but they don't want to talk about it, but I commend you for, you know, being open and talking about this. Cause I really do believe this is important stuff that the public needs to hear. And, uh, your, your position on it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure how much time we've got. I, I can go for hours, but, but I'm not <laughs> sure how much time we've got. But, but um, you know, the circumstances for this show, um, I, I, I got an email from, from, from Michelle saying, Robert, can you, can you fill in? Because there's been a cancellation. And I said, well, sure. Yeah. You know, and that, and, and uh, I'm on. So, if there's ever a time and uh, just like now, you know, give me a call. Well, we'll do it through Michelle, but, but, oh, but yeah. I'm, I'm, um, you know, call, even if, even if it's an hour before the show, if, if I'm here and I answer the phone, we'll do it. Well, you know, it's funny. I knew um, this interview was supposed to be tomorrow, but I was so yeah. excited. I'm like, if you want to do this today, <laughs> let's get her well, done. Okay. Well, I just, um, made a mistake when I texted you to you know, say good. hi, how you doing? Cause I always reach out to the host and, and I always take a look at some of the things that you've done too. I looked at, I looked at your interview style and you know, the energy that you had with your, with your, uh, with your guests and I, okay, this guy's cool. Well, I'm, and, I'm working on it still, you know, it's a work in progress. Cause I like letting the, uh, interviewee run the show, me. you know, I, I technically do. Yeah. Um, but that I do have another question for you. Uh, this related to astrology. So, so what does um, um, psychic abilities and astrology have in common? Because I'm always curious about that. I understand astrology, but what is the correlation there exactly? Are you able to sum that up or give us a, okay. a reference? Um, astrology, in its purest form, is scientific it's um a study and it is a mental analytical study being psychic comes from a different part of the brain okay so somebody can be a really good astrologer by doing the science and then somebody can be a really good astrologer knowing a little bit about the sun signs and they can just, you know, put a chart together and then look at the chart and use their intuition. And then the real geniuses take both and put them together. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so, so it's like an extra, here's how I picture it. It's like an extra power source. It's like it, it yes. helps boost. So, so, um, I don't use a medium per se. Mm-hmm. So, so when I do a reading, you sit down in a nice chair. We have a really short conversation. You know, how you doing today? You know, nice, nice weather. Yeah, okay. Then, then we start the reading. Um, so, um, I'm trying to remember what what we were, we were talking about. So, so, um, and 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 the information just flows through me. I talk. I don't use a medium, so I'm not using cards or crystal ball. I do have cards, and I do have a crystal ball, but but I don't use them as as tools. Yeah. Then there are other people, in order to get in touch with their psychic ability, they'll have a study, um, a medium that they'll use to get in tune, whether it be tarot, whether it be a crystal ball, whether it be palmistry. And by the way, chironomy can be a science, a pseudoscience as well. Chironomy is study of hands, right? Yeah. And um, so, so you, you can do it analytically like that, or you can also do it intuitively too. So using both together. So there are ways of studies, and then there are ways of just getting tuned in. Most people would use a medium so that they can focus. I've never need, I've never needed it. Yeah. Or wanted it. I, or or wanted it. I, you know what that tells me? You're pure, man. (laughs) You're wow. This just, Robert, you're fascinating. You know, I'm Thank definitely going to have to talk to you again. I mean, this is... I'd love to come back. Oh, my gosh. There's so much. I know there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But it's... um, 
Well, yeah, I mean, there's, I know, like you mentioned, we've only scratched the surface and, um, I, I just wanted to get you on cause I was, I was going through the whole list and your name kept popping up. I'm like, yeah. I kept seeing yeah. your name and I kept doing my research. I'm like, this is one guy I'd love to talk to. <laughs> I am. So, I'm so happy that you, you, you chose me. And, um, I guess I chose you too. Cause I worked real hard to, um, you know, make this happen. Well, I really appreciate that. I really do. I know our audience is going to love listening to you. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to share all your links, everything, you. because I really think they need to check you out. Um, Thank you. Because you're just absolutely phenomenal. And um, I'm definitely going to have you back as a guest. I'd, I'd, I'd really like to do that. Without um, a doubt. I'd, I'd really like to come back. Is, and, is uh, there? A, I just want to ask you, is there anything you'd like to tell our audience? Or is there anything that you would like to say or give a shout out to or reference? I have lived above the United States my whole life. And we had a brief conversation at the beginning saying that we're, we're, we're friends. We're Canada, yeah. the United States. Yeah. You know, we are the um, little brother, as it were. And the joke that in Canada is, you know, if the president sneezes, the country <laughs> gets a cold. <laughs> and in, we in Canada... Um, owe our safety and our security to the United States. And if we didn't have that security, we would not have our freedom. And I am very grateful for what is provided by your country, just because we're friends. America is great. America doesn't have to become great again. America's just getting greater. But one of the things that um, I remember growing up, and, and I remember any time there was a problem and the Americans got involved, you knew it got solved. Because the Americans, when the Americans did something, they were the best. And when I see what your country is doing with the pandemic, uh, with the um, Ovid pandemic and taking control of it, that shows why America's great. You're doing it better than anybody right now. Congratulations. Well, thanks, Robert. That's what I'd like to and, say. And, you know, I'd like to tell our audience, too, you know, and uh, going off what you said, you know, Canada is absolutely fantastic. And when I was in the military, I worked with a lot of Canadian forces. And by all means, absolutely the best i know we have something down in colorado called norad uh, it's north oh, yeah. and we watch the airspace and that's uh canada and the united states working together and we've always absolutely. worked together and absolutely. and we are uh while we do we have feel, our differences we're one and the same we have each other's backs we we uh, built the st lawrence seaway together we, we sure did canada, you know we sure did and you know what just because we got a border there, don't mean nothing to me, man. <laughs> it, well, there's a few people that will argue with you. But well, there are a few people, but you know what? It, it, you know what? I was thinking the, the, the border guard, but other than that. <laughs> but, you know, our, our border, well, we have the longest unprotected border in the world. We sure do. And there are parts in the United States and Canada that you can just walk across and nobody even knows. Well, I saw a documentary and a video on YouTube. There's towns along the border where there's no border because the town is built on the border. And and just to see your neighbor, you're, it's like a phone station. You just pick it up. Hey, I'm going to go see my neighbor. Yeah. You're technically supposed to call to let them know. And it's, yeah. but you know what? Everybody looks out for each other. And the border guards know, hey, you know what? These folks are fine. They... It's goofy. I know that sounds goofy just across the street to go see your neighbor. You got to cross the border. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. It is amazing, but it's, uh, <sighs> but it's been an absolute honor, Robert. I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, to speak with us. Um, it's been fun. we'll definitely have you on again. Um, I'm ready. That sounds great. Whenever. That sounds great. Well, thank you again, Robert. Okay. Thank you. See ya. Thanks, brother. That's what Canadians do. Right? Hey.
<laughs> you know, C-A. you know, someone told me something. How how do you spell Canada? C A N A D A. That's funny. <laughs> hey, uh, Robert, hold one moment here, really quick, and thanks again.